So you're about to take the plunge and leave your home country for an adventure abroad. You're now looking at your new life as an expatriate or expat for short. I know from experience that you're focused on the big issues like a great place to live, good climate and food, learning a new language, fitting in with the culture, getting a job and finding a good school for your kids. But there are a lot of other issues that expats have to deal with that you don't think about until you find yourself waist deep in the details. In this video, I'll try to outline the things you need to be aware of, and that a lot of them need to be handled long before you even leave home. This is definitely not the kind of video that I normally make here, but my recent transition from Thailand to Spain brought all of these issues to the surface again, and I thought that putting out these seeds of thought could be helpful for prospective expats. Keep in mind that depending on your home country and your expat country and the services you use while overseas, these factors will affect you more or less, but it's always better to be prepared. You're lucky if you're going to a country with very open policies or have a special situation like being in the military or a company is transplanting you with full assistance. You're not so lucky if you're doing everything yourself or you're heading into a country that's notoriously difficult. So don't be afraid to decide no and look somewhere else or postpone the idea for a while. Several of these factors are interconnected, so it's difficult to make a single defined list. So in the video, I'll introduce concepts and then refer to them later if there's some overlap. I'll give some examples from my experiences along the way from calling Canada and America my home countries and then living in Australia, Germany, Scotland, Thailand, and now newly in Spain as my expat adventure continues plus some other interesting experiences I've been told about from dozens of experienced expat friends. Since I'm putting a lot of detail down here, this is going to be a bit long. I'll mark the timeline into sections, and if a section doesn't apply to you, then feel free to skip over it. I would strongly recommend, however, that you watch it all the way through the first time, and then come back later to recap certain issues that you're running into. Okay, let's get started. Please feed the YouTube algorithm by giving the video a like. If you want to see more like this, click subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of new videos. If you want to chip in on my expenses, I now have Patreon and YouTube memberships. Preparation. Are you a detail-oriented person? Because you'll be the one driving your process and you'll be the only one who cares if it works. Research, research, research. Build a five-year plan and this will help you focus. Do Google searches on every possible thing that you can think of. Build a spreadsheet or keep written notes on important factors and build a timeline for important events that come in sequence and are often interconnected. Watching this video is a good part of that planning, but don't trust one random guy on the internet to give you the magic keys to the kingdom. Join Facebook expat groups in your prospective country. Go on the groups and read, 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 and then ask informed questions on anything that's still not clear. These expat groups vary from generally helpful to generally toxic, so take them with a grain of salt. Be sure to do your homework first and don't post, how can I move from the States to somewhere in Europe and expect someone to spoon feed you? I strongly recommend visiting your prospective location first for as long as you can, since the reality of being on the ground will help you with your final decision. And think about life there as a resident rather than a tourist. Talk with your friends and family about your ideas. You're going to get a lot of discouragement because they'll think you're crazy. And also think about your new life without these people nearby. Are you the kind of person who needs your loved ones close or can you successfully detach yourself for a new life? Culture. I'm putting this right near the top because above all, you really need to decide if this new country fits in with what you can handle in your personal lifestyle. Major issues like religion, can you handle a country with a dominant religion that's also the foundation of the government and therefore the legal system? Civil rights. Is the country tolerant to your gender identity, how you dress, and who you choose to love? Can you handle the way laws are enforced for your safety and security with crime and corruption? Do the locals have a reputation you can handle? Are they overly friendly, closed off, or outright hostile to foreigners? How will you integrate being an introvert or extrovert? Do you need the hot sun or do you enjoy the cold? Do you like dry or rainy? Are you a city or rural person, mountains or seaside? Will you be able to get along in your home language or do you need to commit to power learning the local language and be better accepted by the locals? Learn what's considered polite and impolite with small talk, 
eating, children, visiting someone's house, schedules, and business dynamics? Are you willing to broaden your horizon with local food and cooking ingredients? Can you handle completely different government bureaucracies and customer service standards? How will you adapt to the local alcohol and recreational drug rules? Will you slip into the easy bar lifestyle? Can you do your favorite hobbies and activities? And this is key, no matter what's happening, stay calm, stay respectful, and you'll have a better chance of success. The cost of living. Do your research to make sure your incoming funds are comfortably more than your prospective outgoing funds. There are one-time things like buying a property, a car, a motorbike, and furniture that can take a big chunk of your funds right away. Then you've got ongoing expenses like taxes, medical costs, rent, groceries, restaurants, school, transportation, entertainment, repairs, insurance, visa renewals, and lots more. Take whatever number you come up with and add 50% to your expenses because there are always things that come up. And don't think that you can just get by, as you may up having to abandon the plan and go back home. Money is hard. Who is taking the leap? If it's just you going, things are as simple as they can be, which isn't simple in any way, shape, or form. If you have a spouse or partner, they will have all of the same visa factors. If you're legally married, it will be slightly easier for you to apply as a pair, but you'll need to show your marriage license. If you're bringing kids, they will get their visas piggybacking on yours, and yes, they all need their own passports, even newborns. If you're bringing animals, they will have to follow the expat country's rules on veterinarian checks, vaccinations, quarantine, and microchipping. And it may just be impossible to bring your pet, or they would be required to be in a quarantine facility for six months, and this may be a deal breaker for your family. Luckily, there's an entire industry that ships pets around the world and handles the veterinary and other paperwork for you. Visas. Each country has a short list of visas that allow people to live there. A large population of expats are retired and retirement style visas are widely available. Retirement visas have a minimum age and usually require some form of financial disclosure or bank deposit to make sure that you have the funds to survive and you likely cannot work or earn any money in your expat country. Now you might get a work visa. If your home country company is transferring you, they will likely provide you with assistance through the whole process and sponsor you for a work visa. IBM did this for me and my family in Germany and Scotland, and it was so smooth and painless. I miss that. Otherwise, getting a work visa can force your prospective expat country employer to prove that you're not going to be taking a job away from a native of your expat country. And unless you have super high level or very rare job skills, this can be difficult. Some countries are starting a new digital nomad visa to encourage skilled people to live and work, but they have widely different requirements and you can definitely not be a penniless backpacker busking in the subway or doing Instagram videos. You may be going on a student visa, which means you're zeroing into a university program. And finally, some countries have a visa by investment, sometimes called a golden visa. This is where you buy a property for cash over a certain quite high value, or you invest large sums in a business or government securities. If you're not exactly certain about the country you want to go to, look into the visa options in countries in your general search region and see what matches your needs best. Documentation. Be warned, documentation for an expat move is Vogon level bureaucracy. First, make sure your passports are nice and fresh and have years left before they expire and plenty of blank pages for stickers and stamps. I would say just go ahead and get new passports or have at least a minimum of five years of validity left as that gives you some time to get settled in before applying for a new passport. Passport processing times are very long now, so this is definitely a plan in advance step. Getting your visa will be right in your face as it's a mandatory step to getting permission to reside in a country. But here are some traps that you might not be expecting. You will need a lot of documentation from your home country and perhaps even your last expat country of residence. You will need passports, birth certificates, marriage certificate or proof of divorce, criminal background check, school transcripts, proof of earning a degree via transcripts or the actual diploma itself, and other documents may be required. 
And this is obviously a big problem if you don't have these documents. Maybe it's been a long time since you graduated, you don't physically have the diploma, your school changed names, or it doesn't exist anymore. These documents, or certified copies of them, may need to be within a certain number of months old, likely three months. So figure out how to request them from the school, the business, or the government agency. To start the process, these documents may need to be translated into the official language of your expat country by a certified translation company, and then they may need to be legally validated. And there are two ways to validate a document. Notarized means an ink stamp and embossed seal is placed on a document that says, this person signed this piece of paper, but that carries very little weight for a visa. To get full validation, most countries require an apostille of official documents. An apostille is my new least favorite word. An apostille is a government certification that the document itself is valid and legal. As an example, here's the process to get a criminal background check from America if you're applying for a visa somewhere on an American passport. Download the FBI fingerprint form from their website. Print it out on thick paper and have your local police station do your prints or a friend if your local cops refuse like they do in Thailand. Mail your prints to the FBI. The FBI has drastically slowed their turnaround. Now it takes two months to receive the letter that you're clear or it lists whatever bad stuff they found. The US State Department is the official apostille agency for the FBI letter. The bad thing is the US State Department is currently taking another three to four months to do an apostille. You can try to shuffle the documentation yourself between the FBI and state, but I found it's worth hiring an agency to do it. If you're headed off to yet another country, you may also need a background check from your current expat country, and that background check pro process obviously varies from place to place. In Thailand, the Royal Thai Police wouldn't start a background check on me without an introduction letter from the Spanish Embassy asking they to do it, them to do it. But the Spanish Embassy say they do not issue this letter. Now don't ask me how I got past this catch-22. And then, on top of everything, you may run into a timing issue depending on how old each document in your application package can be for your expat country to accept it. You need a trusted person back home. And this is one thing that definitely nobody thinks about. Since you are not physically in your home country, somebody will be needed to perform critical services on your behalf. I strongly suggest finding a family member or trustworthy friend and set them up with a power of attorney on things like your bank and investment accounts and any other tasks that re require physical, personal, legal access. We'll refer to this home country helper as your person. Now, hiring a mailbox service can handle some of these issues for me, and I'll talk about that in depth a bit later. What about your home country home? If you own your home, some expats sell it and some rent them out. If you sell, then you have no physical link that needs to be managed. If you rent it out, I suggest hiring a rental agent with a good reputation. They screen renters, collect rent, do maintenance, and when things go bad, they handle things like evictions and other legal issues, and that's what you're paying them for. When I lived in Australia, my Austin rental agent was terrible, despite the glowing reviews I got, so keep in contact with them to make sure things are going smoothly. A friend or family member may not be able to handle the workload for this, or be able to follow through completely when things get tough. Then, what do you do with your personal home goods? Do you leave them in the home? Or do you store them with a friend or family? Don't even think about using paid storage. You're just lighting your money on fire every month for no good reason. Trust me, I stored my car for 10 years. And yes, I did try to sell it, but nobody wants a home converted electric Porsche. And it was illegal to import it to Thailand. So, Bottom line, just sell or give things away. It's cheaper in the long run, even if you have to repurchase things when you get home. And this is a lesson because part of being an expat is learning to let things go and be at peace with it. Shipping your personal goods. You're heading overseas, but you still want all of your things to make you feel at home. The stuff that we just got finished talking about. My advice, forget it. I recommend only shipping critical, personal things that you cannot possibly find in your expat country, even if you'll end up spending money on duplicate items. 
Consider packing large suitcases when you make your flight over. This can be way cheaper than any other shipping method. The first bag or two are free and can be quite heavy, and then additional bags are paid by weight. A good trip trick is to buy bargains from departing expats and then sell them before you go. And there are websites and groups specifically for this. Beware the difference between home and expat country power as 120 volts versus 240 will blow up your device real good. If you do ship some things, you will be in for significant shipping costs, lengthy transit times, and potential import duties. And some countries even want to tax you on your own incoming used personal goods. Now, do you want door-to-door -door service, including packing and unpacking? Or maybe you can pre-pack yourself and save some money. There are a lot of options, so get many quotes, ask questions, and check the online ratings from previous customers. What is your home mailing address? This seems trivial, but I'm here to tell you it's a field of landmines. Your home life is linked to your mailing address. But now you're living overseas and you have a postal address there, but who do you notify that you moved? Be very careful. For some businesses and government services, it's critical to maintain a home country address. But how can you do this? You need someone willing to accept postal mail for you. That person can open letters, take pictures, or scan the pages and then email it over to you. And then they can take any necessary action that you ask them to perform. As I mentioned earlier, you can sign up for a mailbox service that you pay per month to handle your postal mail. And they are in business to scan, forward, fax, deposit checks by mail, and perform other services and all managed through your account on their website. Now, some governments and businesses are starting to recognize these mailbox services as non-residential addresses and may reject you living there. So you have to find one that really tries to make it look like you do live there. Of course, this means that you have to notify all of your home country contacts of this new home postal address before you go. And I like to call this my address of convenience. And the bad side of your home address will come up shortly. Renting or buying a property in your expat country. This can be a nightmare of complexity, cost, scams, and legal issues. This subject is a whole video to itself, so I would just say research this extensively on the pitfalls of property purchasing and rental in your prospective expat country. My strongest advice, hire a local buyer's agent who will handle the entire A to Z process for you. You pay them and they work for you. They are the local experts and they protect your interests in the deal. My fantastic buyer's agent in Barcelona not only found two issues with the deed that blocked the sale, but they also negotiated 10% off the list price. Beware of scams. Never send money for a deposit without seeing the property and confirming that the selling agent and the property are legit. After you move in, get renter or homeowner insurance because bad things happen and you do not want to be out of pocket for thefts, fires, floods, or significant maintenance. Notify all expat country contacts that this is your new postal address. Beware that your expat bank may charge massive fees, and I mean massive, simply to print a paper bank check to be handed over when purchasing your new home. So try whatever you have to do to negotiate the rate down. In many countries, including Thailand, when you're buying property, keep documented proof that the funds for buying the property came from an overseas source. This is important because when you sell the property and you want to move the money back out of the country without a lot of hassle, you need this documentation. Health issues. Be sure to get traveler's health insurance before you leave home, and this will cover you during your transition. You will almost certainly need a health insurance policy in your expat country to comply with your visa regulations because they don't want you to be immediately a burden on the public health service. Although you may get one with your local employer that could be in compliance with the rules. If not, you'll find multiple private insurance companies that have policies specifically designed to fulfill the visa requirements. Note that some policies have maximum age limits, but if you're already a customer, you may get grandfathered in as you get older. And policy costs skyrocket as you get up in years, which can make it unaffordable, but it's mandatory. So there's another catch 22. 
For Americans, we get access to Medicare at 65, but there are time limits to being overseas and we have to fly home for treatment to be covered. So only use that for major health issues. Some things to ponder. Do you have an illness that requires specialized doctors? You may not be able to find equivalent care or medications. And if you're on a long-term medication, see if you can buy it locally or you may have to have it shipped from home. Shipping medications is risky. It could have big duty and tax applied or even just seized by the government. Getting quality mental health treatment is noted as very difficult by many expats. Counseling may be limited or unavailable. And especially finding school resources, medication and therapy for children with issues like autism or ADHD could be a deal breaker for the whole trip. Banking and investing. This may be the most complex and tricky factor during your entire stay overseas, we all have to deal with money. Money comes in and out of our accounts. We have credit and debit cards. We go to ATMs. We manage our retirement funds and pensions. Now, governments are really worried about terrorism and drug money. So they've enacted a growing list of rules and regulations. And due to America's influence, these rules are also rolled out across the world. There's an authentication system called KYC, Know Your Customer. Financial institutions use this to confirm you are who you are and that the source and destination of your funds is legitimate. Due to these rules, things have gotten really bad for us trying to live our lives straddling two or more countries. So let's talk about our home country bank first. Home country banks may cancel your accounts or refuse to open one if they know you're living overseas. I've heard of multiple UK banks canceling expat accounts that have been open for decades. Companies may literally not be able to talk with you or respond to emails if they know that you're overseas. Your person back home is valuable here since they can deposit paper checks, pay bills, buy or sell stock, and request disbursements from your retirement accounts. Credit and debit cards are mailed to you occasionally, and your bank will default to the home country address they have on file. You can ask that the card is forwarded to you, or some banks will actually send to your overseas address for an additional fee. It might help to tell them that you're on vacation and you need the card while you're still there. There are credit cards that are friendlier to expats like Citibank, Chase, and American Express. It's worth investigating a new card before you leave. Any paper checks in your home currency that show up will need to be deposited in your home bank account. If the check is physically at home, that's relatively straightforward for your person to handle. If the paper check arrives in your expat country, you'll have to mail the check back home directly to the bank or to your person who can take it to the bank for you. Because expat banks take months and charge large fees to process foreign checks, or they may even outright refuse to process it. Using an ATM card while overseas can have big hidden fees and bad exchange rates. So try to find a no fee card like from Schwab and only used bank labeled ATMs. Always decline an ATM's offer of setting the exchange rate for your withdrawal. Let your home bank do it and you'll get a much better rate. Never ever use an ATM from a company called Euronet. They are literally everywhere in Europe and set outrageous fees and bad exchange rates to catch unwary travelers. Now, of course, you'll need a bank in your expat country. Banks are greedy and you may be subject to huge monthly fees just to have an account. So ask around in your local expat community for recommendations. Be sure to check out the new crop of online only banks to see if their limited branchless services are sufficient for your needs. In order to get better service, I have now cultivated my guy at my bank branch. I go to my guy for everything I need. I buy the extra financial products. I give him the highest ratings for her services. And then I ask for discounts. You can reduce or eliminate fees by having a direct deposit of your salary or buying services like renter and health insurance. I got a free account by purchasing a thousand shares of the bank stock. It's now up 52% and they pay dividends too, so the joke is on them. Your expat bank will very likely give you a debit card and online access linked to your account. You can apply for a credit card but some banks like Thailand, they just won't do it for expats unless you preload funds into the account tied to the credit card. 
your bank may offer accounts in different currencies so you can receive and hold and then convert when exchange rates are good. You may be able to install your expat bank debit card into your Android or iPhone to enable the tap to pay system that you can use at stores and restaurants. But I found my tap to pay works about 80% of the time, so I'm forced to carry the physical debit card with me anyway, but I always try to use the tap system first. In Thailand, nearly every time you do something with a teller, you have to bring your passport and you will sign every photocopy or computer printout. For additional security, Banks are now sending codes to you via SMS text messages, email, or their own app in your phone. And we'll talk about the resulting big problems with that more in an upcoming section. Transferring money. It's a fact of life that you'll have to move money across borders and between different currencies. So be prepared to get completely screwed over by this industry on exchange rates and transfer fees. Transfer service companies will charge you a percentage of the amount you transfer which is absurd because it's just a different number in a single electronic transaction. So shop around with different transfer companies to find the best fee structure. Now, some will also try to make a hidden profit by adding a bit to the exchange rate, while others guarantee that you get the real bank exchange rate. If your bank or investment company is big enough, they can do international transfers through the SWIFT network. And there are other services like WISE, formerly TransferWISE, DMoney, Sable, Smart Currency Exchange, and World Remit. Note that you may have to go through the services Know Your Customer procedure <clears throat> if you're a new customer. You may also have to be a resident of the country of their base of operations to be legally accepted. And they may make you prove the source of your funds. And finally, know that some services do simple one-time transfers while others give more powerful tools like setting up a repeating transfer schedule or making a transfer when the exchange rate hits your target or locking in an, ex an agreed exchange rate over an extended period of time. Telephones. Right now, you've probably got a mobile phone with a SIM card and a phone number assigned to your home country. When you arrive in your expat country, immediately sign up for a local number, which can be put into your phone with another SIM card or an eSIM, which is a new electronic SIM system that most newer mobile phones can handle. Then you choose a plan with the amount of minutes and data you think you'll need. Despite the desire to save money, do not, I repeat, do not cancel your home phone number. You may be able to modify your home country phone service to cut way down on the voice and data to minimize the ongoing costs. To save a ton of money, never use your home SIM for voice or data when overseas or you'll get killed on roaming charges. Now this leads us to a key point. Banks and online shopping sites now like to send a security code by SMS to your phone that you then use to complete your transaction. This is called two-factor authentication. Therefore, when you do a web purchase with your home bank, switch on your home SIM, get the SMS code and switch the SIM off again you'll usually not be charged for incoming SMS messages. The complication is sometimes these SMS messages do not get forwarded from your home country's phone carrier to your expat phone carrier to your phone. It's just black magic, and if it does work, just be thankful. An alternative to maintaining a real home mobile phone account is to use an internet phone. This is sometimes called VOIP service or voice over internet protocol. Systems like Skype, Magic Jack, Google Voice, Zoom, Vonage, Mint, and others provide a way for you to make and receive voice, phone calls, and SMS messages via an app in your phone. You will choose or be assigned a phone number in your home country so it looks like you are in your home country. But you'll get the calls and SMS messages anywhere on the planet that you have local data service, even via Wi-Fi sitting in a coffee shop somewhere. I've had generally good luck with Magic Jack, but some companies use an SMS generation service that Magic Jack doesn't forward and the messages just don't arrive. Other SMSs arrive just fine and there's no way to know if your services, SMSs, will arrive in your expat country and your phone until you try it for the first time. Taxes. Taxes again are a super complicated issue. So do extensive research on the tax procedures in your home and expat countries. I am not a tax professional and in no way depend on what I say here. Some home expat country pairings have special tax treaties 
that can be good or your bad for your tax situation. First, you will very likely be taxed on any income earned in your expat country. And make sure that your visa allows you to earn that income or you might be caught and deported. The applicable tax treaties may allow for any expat taxes you pay to be credited against your home country tax return, thus avoiding double taxation. The US and some countries will, in my humble opinion, unfairly tax you on your worldwide income. For me, this includes Spain too. Now, some countries and regions within countries also have a wealth tax that will impose a tax on your worldwide assets like bank accounts, investments, houses, cars, boats, art, jewelry, and you get to pay that every year. For me, this also includes Barcelona. Now, I know what you're thinking. Don't try to hide anything because there's a lot of information exchanged between countries. And if they find out, you will be in for massive financial penalties and maybe deportation. For me in Spain, I will calculate and pay worldwide income tax to Spain in March, then file a US return in April using the foreign tax credit for the taxes I paid to Spain. The US foreign earned income credit is also available to expats, along with several other tax code items. Now, that was all federal level taxes. What do you do about your home, state, province, or subregion taxes? You will have to file a tax return for that location too, just as if you were still living there. The state will receive your income information based on your mailing address and you, that you give to your federal tax agency employer or investment company or anybody that manages your money and files reports with the government. If you do not plan to return to the same region, you might want to take the opportunity to quote unquote move to a location that doesn't have an income tax. Then you only pay federal taxes. After I left California, I filed as a non-resident for several years until one day they seized a substantial amount of money in back taxes and penalties from my bank account. It took me six months to prove to them that they were wrong and I got a full refund minus the seizure fee that my bank charged me. I didn't want to risk that again, so I moved to Texas, which does not have a state income tax. Pensions. A lot of expats are nearing at or beyond their home country's official company or government pension age. Since it's so specific, you've got to check with all of your pension sources and find out how to apply while overseas. For our convenience, most countries will do a direct deposit to an overseas bank account, as they probably already handle a lot of retired expats. Sometimes this uh, expat bank account has to be a very specific type of incoming bank account that not all banks in your expat country may want to provide as it involves know your customer factors. Worst case, you can have a direct deposit to your home bank or a paper check sent to your home address, which your person then handles for you. You would then occasionally transfer funds over to your expat country to cover your living expenses. Now I've heard of countries like the UK that do not give yearly increases in your payout amount if you're out of the country for a certain amount of time. And they also require periodic letters showing proof of life or they will just stop paying. In Australia, in order to start collecting your pension, you have to move back and live there for two years. So read up on your country's pension rules very, very carefully to make sure you don't lose out. Activities. It's easy to think you'll instantly fit into the lifestyle and have fun, but that's not always the reality. You gotta be prepared to put in the effort to keep yourself busy, perhaps outside of work or school. Find local groups through meetup or internations that match your interests and hobbies. There are lots of language exchanges where you can meet people from all over the world and make new friends. There are groups and apps for dating to find that special new someone in your life. Find a cinema that you like that has a language you understand from voice or subtitles. And here in Spain, that's identified by the code VOCE, which means basically original voice. Find stores that support your hobbies and make some contacts and friends there. See if there's a local group of people with the same interests. Explore your area on foot. Go to parks, find some favorite restaurants and hangouts. Take date trips around your area. Take holidays even farther out. But here's the thing. 
don't get stuck in the sit on the couch lifestyle. You moved overseas for the adventure. Grab it with both hands. Driver's licenses. This is mandatory. Get an international driver's permit before you leave home. Most people call it an international driver's license, but it's really a permit or an IDP. In America, you get them at the AAA office. In most other countries, you go to the driver's license office. Frankly, I think it's a useless piece of cardboard, but nearly all countries require it. You can usually drive in your expat country with the combination of IDP and your home license for six months to one year. Any longer than this and you have to get a local license or risk getting fined. That could be as simple as swapping your license at the motor vehicle office, but you might have to take eye focus, color blindness, uh, reaction time tests, or watch instructional videos. In certain cases, you might have to do a rules of the road written exam. Worst case, you might have to do a driving test plus all the rest. Here in Spain, they treat anyone outside the EU like they have never driven a vehicle in their entire lives. So here in Barcelona, I have to attend a driving school to learn the Spanish words for the words on the driving test. I then take a written test and I take a driving test. Never mind that I've been driving for 45 years all over the planet. Importing a car. Another thing from home that you love is your vehicle. It's your baby and cars are expensive. So of course you want to bring it along. Don't. In 99% of all cases, I would strongly discourage this. First, it may be illegal based on the import laws of the country. And if it is legal, you'll pay import duty and taxes. In addition, it must be compliant with local regulations and go through an inspection and possible modification and registration process. Then you have to find insurance, which could be tough for a card that the local companies don't have in their quoting and billing system. Then where do you park it? Some countries and cities are notoriously bad for parking or outrageously expensive. Some countries do have a special rule for classic cars, so it may be a little easier on the inspection and modern equipment issues. In Thailand, it is completely illegal to bring in a used car. In Mexico, you can import a car only if you have temporary residency. If you're permanent, you can't do it. You have to buy one that's already there. And if you have temporary residency and import a car, when you change over into permanent residency within three to four years, you have to drive that car back out of the country to America. Now, on top of all of this, I know for a fact that the American ambassador to Thailand shipped his Tesla over to Bangkok. It's good to be a diplomat, I guess. Okay, we agreed you're leaving your car at home, but you still need to get around. You may need to buy or rent a car or motorbike after you arrive. If you're getting a motorbike, look at the safety of the roads very carefully before you choose to ride one. Now, getting a loan to buy a car may be impossible as banks don't like the risk of making a loan to an expat, so plan for paying cash. Out of every bank in Australia, only Westpac would give me a car loan, and I was working at ANZ Bank at the time. If you're lucky, your location has great public transport, and I would strongly suggest using it if it's possible with your lifestyle. And I'm super lucky that Barcelona's system is so great. Home internet. Most of the world has good high-speed internet by now, by fiber or DSL, or you can even use your mobile phone as a Wi-Fi hotspot. So check with other local expats about which companies have good service and pricing and will will even, you know, wire up the home of an expat. Perhaps without the certain government documents you're not going to be able to get for a while. Watch out for hidden charges or huge jumps in your monthly fee after an introductory period. Worst case, you can sign up for SpaceX's Starlink service, which is high-speed satellite service available in about half of the world so far. Virtual private networks. Some websites refuse to work or handle you differently based on your geographical presence. Streaming video websites are known to tailor your content to the local audience, so you may be missing out on movies that you could watch back home. And banks might outright refuse to even let you log in based on where you are on the planet. Online shopping websites get confused about what language to show you, which currency to use, and how to calculate shipping costs. And even some countries have enacted a giant internet wall. Now this is where VPNs can be your friend. 
There are a lot of vendors out there with high quality and very fast connections. And with a VPN, you get the triple benefit of encrypted communications, piercing firewalls, and selecting which country you want to be quote unquote originating from. I suggest setting two up. So if you have a problem with one in a particular country, you can easily switch to the second one. Now you should note that the Opera web browser has a free VPN built into it, but it has limited features. So I would go with one of the, the good VPN companies and they're always listed with huge discounts. So just watch any YouTube video and you'll get something from uh, one of the VPN companies. Postal services and buying online. Eventually, you'll have things mailed or shipped to your expat address. Some countries' postal services are good, and some are awful, especially for package delivery. They can charge huge import taxes and fees, and you're just at their mercy. In Thailand, Thailand Post is pretty good, but UPS and DHL are known for adding additional fees, and they won't deliver until you pay up. I've heard a lot of horror stories about bad deliveries around the world, so set your expectations low. Discourage friends and family from sending you things from home, as you'll pay high fees and some items may just be confiscated. To find special treats from home, give incoming visitors a shopping list that they can pack for you in a suitcase, or go to a local Taste of Home style shop. Another thing to try is Amazon has a service where they have banks of lockers around major cities, and you can have a package delivered into one of the slots of, your lo of a locker, which you then unlock with their app on your phone. Other companies uh, in different areas will actually receive packages for you and hold it, notify you that they've been delivered, then you can go and pick them up at your leisure. My problem with my building here is we have a security lock on the street, and unless I'm home, when they buzz my buzzer, I'm not getting my package. So it's packages are a logistical nightmare. Voting. Unless you renounce your home country citizenship, you generally retain the right to vote in your home country. But again, where do you live? Your last real residence or your address of convenience? Unless you tell your voting office that you've moved, they will generally consider you to continue to be a valid in-person voter there. If you tell them that you're living overseas, they may be able to set you up on an absentee or vote by mail system, which is actually quite common for expats and for people in the military overseas. In my situation, I get an email notification from my voting office. I download a voting document and print it out. I fill in the boxes and sign it. I scan it, then I email the scan file to a US government service called Vote by Fax at the email address fax at fvap.gov. Vote by fax takes my voting package and faxes it to the voting office as required. It's all a bit antiquated, but it gets the job done for the last 10 years. Now see what your voting office can do for you. It may be easy, hard, or impossible. End of life. And finally, we come to end of life. We have to think about how to deal with the situation when something goes wrong when we're overseas, like a serious illness, accident, or death. Set up a financial will and living will in both your home and expat country. Depending on the country, your partner may or may not have full control or inheritance over your assets when you die. Fully inform your chosen executor on all aspects of your life and what they should expect when you get very sick or kick the bucket. I've done this through an emergency information letter that I update periodically and send to a small group of people, including my executor. This letter lists all property owned, bank accounts, insurance policies, vehicles, and don't forget about computer and website passwords. Now think about how you want to be handled when you're medically incapacitated, either temporarily or permanently. Think about shipping your body home or opt for cremation in your expat country. Your executor may be forced to sell your expat home quite quickly, in fact pay taxes, dispose of your household goods, and handle closing down your bank accounts. This will absolutely require an extended stay in your expat country by your executor. So be sure to grant them all of the powers they will need to complete the processes in the face of expat country bureaucracy. And the lawyer who writes up your wills in your expat country will guide you through all of these important details.
wrap up. Okay, that's all I can think of now. Are you scared? Do you still want to go through with it? I hope you do. It will definitely be a challenge, but it's worth it in the end. Let me know in the comments the good and bad things you found while planning for or living your expat lifestyle. And feel free to pass the links to the video around in different expat groups or anybody you know who's living or thinking about moving overseas because we want to get all of the good information out to these people so they can make informed decisions. Thanks. Just before we wrap up, I want to thank my Patreons, Peter Bouvier and Puppy, for their support. We also just popped over 2,000 subscribers, which is quite a nice milestone for my little channel. All support is greatly appreciated. Hey, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if so, please give it a thumbs up. I see that 81% of the viewers aren't subscribed. Please do, as it does help the YouTube algorithm. Take care, and see you next time.